Coming up on DTNS, all hail the Pixel 6. Does dark mode really help your battery life? And the latest to combat collisions. Let's see. This is the Daily Tech News for Monday, August 2nd, 2021. From Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. In Cinematic Cleveland, Ohio, I'm Rich Raffalino. And I'm Roger Chang, the show's producer. For the show, we were talking about uh, movies that were based in either San Francisco or Cleveland for no reason, you know, <laughs> just chose those two cities amongst ourselves. Uh, if you want to get the wider conversation in our expanded show, or if you have ideas of what movies we might want to watch that are based on the cities that we know and love, Good Day Internet it would be the uh, great way to do it. Become a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Intel's general manager of its client computing group, Gregory Bryant, posted a photo, now deleted, with some specifications for Thunderbolt 5. The photo claims this will offer up to 80 gigabits per second connections over USB-C using a novel 3-bit data signal that boosts bits per signal from previous Thunderbolt implementations by 50%. Square intends to acquire the Australian buy now, pay later finance company Afterpay in a $29 billion deal. This would be Square's largest acquisition. The Australian Competition and Consumer Commission still needs to review and approve the deal. The Indian government launched eRupee, a new person and purpose specific digital payment solution. The name is a portmanteau of Rupee and the country's popular Unified Payments Interface, or UPI. This is a limited launch currently only available at select hospitals in the country. India eventually plans to use eRupee to entirely replace cash for medical or educational aid. eRupee essentially provides beneficiaries with a prepaid voucher for a specific purpose. Uh, it's sent through SMS or QR code and doesn't require a digital payment app or bank account to access the voucher. It also uses two-step verification for security. Personal details aren't shared when redeeming the voucher, although the insurer of the voucher can track when it is redeemed. The State Bank of India, HDFC Bank, ICICI Bank, and Kotak Bank have all gone live with eRupee. Windows 365 is now available for business customers. Pricing starts at $20 per user per month for those with an existing Windows 10 Pro license, providing one virtual CPU, two gigs of RAM, and 64 gigs of storage. The top tier eight virtual CPUs, 32 gigabytes of RAM, and 512 gigabytes of storage cloud PC starts at $162 per month. Those without a Windows 10 Pro license pay $4 more per month per user. French intelligence investigators say Pegasus spyware has been found on the phones of three journalists, including a senior staff member at the country's international television station, France 24. This is significant because it's the first time an independent authority has corroborated the findings of Forbidden Stories, a Paris-based nonprofit media organization, and Amnesty International, both of who initially had access to a leaked list of 50,000 numbers that are believed to belong to people of interest by clients of the Israeli firm NSO Group since 2016, and they shared that access with their media partners. All right, let's get out to sea, shall we? <laughs> Automatic Identification System, or AIS, is a wireless radio technology designed to prevent collisions at sea. Using GPS data, AIS broadcasts a ship's identity, position, course, and also speed to other ships in the area every few seconds. Everybody knows where everybody is. As long as it works well. <laughs> the signals are limited, but a global network of private and public shore-based AIS receivers and satellite receptions pick up these signals, which are then aggregated across the web. According to an analysis by the nonprofit Sky Truth and Global Fishing Watch, since August of 2020, over 100 warships from at least 14 European countries, as well as Russia and also the U.S., have had locations faked using AIS. These faked locations were often disputed or in territorial waters of another country, lasting up to days at a time. These were initially discovered by Sky Truth researcher Bjorn Bergman after hearing about the Swedish Navy, and Navy having had locations faked. After looking at various data fields embedded in AIS signals, Bergman was able to tease out the fakes. Researchers weren't able to tie the fake signals to any country, organization, or even an individual, but shared common characteristics indicated that they came from the same actor. 
Part of the problem is that AIS is in an unencrypted system, with some in the security community calling for adding digital signatures to each AIS transmission going forward. Yeah, there's a there's a couple interesting threads kind of coming together here. I mean, one is kind of that ever present. Um, what happens when we add scale to something that works well fairly locally? You know, AIS being unencrypted maybe not an issue when it's not easy to aggregate every single AIS yeah. signal together or something like that. All of a sudden, bringing together. But also, you know, we, we've been kind of covering a lot of um, more uh, 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 high level security concerns as of late, uh, you know, kind of just just cropping up. And, you know, we, we've heard rumblings of, uh, you know, when when cyber attacks can become, you know, national security threats or, you know, lead to even, you know, combat or escalation, stuff like that. And, you know, this is a, a, this is literally like a bond plot. Uh, if you watch the movie Tomorrow mm -hmm. Never Dies, this is like the reverse of that in like a weird way. Uh, which would kind of surprise me seeing that uh, in real life. Uh, so, you know, kind of yet another surface area that we need to be aware of. Luckily, I mean, I don't know the the what it would take to implement something like, uh, uh, you know, uh, adding digital signatures to these kind of things, what kind of expense that would add to fleets and, and how easy that would be to implement. That, you know, saying that sounds very easy to fix, I wonder in practice, given that this is a global system and kind of everybody, uh, uh, I, not opting in, but kind of, you know, kind of running on an honor system almost. Uh, I wonder yeah. if that, how feasible that is to roll out in, in the near term. Yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> honor system, it's a, that, that is a term that I feel like, I don't know, I have friends who have a sailboat and every once in a while I'm out there with them and it does feel very honor system-esque, right? Like no one wants to hurt each other. Let's all just make sure we're, you know where I am. See me? Okay, we're going this way. You're going that way. All good. And that does work fine uh, most of the time, but when when you think about you know espionage and and the idea that ships are going to be a, a big part of that, depending on who you are and what country you represent, the idea that this would be so easily hackable is something probably to 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 uh, to, to to investigate. The other thing to note, though, is that uh, I believe military vessels are not required to use AIS. Uh, so, the, like the, I guess maybe the worst case scenario is that just <laughs> militaries turn these off in general. So, if you see a signal from them, you know it's fake. I don't think that's in anyone's best interest. These are massive ships. Obviously, we don't want them getting into trouble and, and hitting into each other. Uh, but that is something to note as well. Mm -hmm. All right, well, YouTube confirmed it's testing a premium light subscription offering ad-free viewing for €6.99 a month without uh, other YouTube premium features like offline downloads or background playback. The feature is currently testing in Belgium, Denmark, Finland, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, Norway, and Sweden. YouTube said this is an experiment and could roll out more plans based on feedback. Sarah, not available to us now, but uh, are you going to uh, crack open some YouTube premium lights? You know, I'm really used to ads on YouTube. Uh, I know many of us sort of, we either look the other way or suffer through them kind of a thing. I don't. I pay for YouTube TV, which is sort of the cable alternative, which is, <laughs> you know, a service I think is, is worth my money. But YouTube itself, no. I just kind of deal with an ad experience. But I, I was, you know, looking at this story earlier, I was thinking... Well, what would I pay, though? I mean, the ads are annoying. I wish they weren't there. Yeah, I don't really want to see them. What would I pay? And it sounds like what YouTube is is trying out is, well, okay, there was a package that was a little bit more expensive that also offered things like offline downloads. That would be that would be advantageous to me when I was traveling, for example. Uh, background playback, you know, another thing where, you, where you're multitasking. That is also stuff I wouldn't really pay for. But would I just pay for one of those things? And, you know, if I was the person who wasn't going to pay for any of that stuff, then YouTube isn't getting any of my money. But if I say, hmm, if you lower the price a little bit and then I don't have ads anymore, then maybe that's a little bit more attractive to me, especially if, you know, it's, it's in my price range. Yeah, I wonder you know, if this is a signal of how much or, or the lack of traction that maybe the standard YouTube premium has been getting overall in terms of, you know, the money that YouTube makes, it's it's a money making machine for, for Google, obviously, uh, you know, if, if that's kind of not moving where they need to move to uh, and they're, and maybe they're, I'm wondering if this will um, kind of, 
be the be the spur for okay maybe we're not going to experiment with more features we're going to experiment with that price point right is is six euro, or seven euros or seven dollars or whatever it ends up being if it ever comes to the us is that the price point that gets you to go ad free and does that make sense versus what they can make you know serving ads up uh, I think it is interesting. And and just uh, a note here, I want to make sure we clarify that uh, YouTube Music, or I'm sorry, YouTube Premium does include YouTube Music. That's one of the things that you do not, not get uh, with the Premium Light subscription. So it is a very, I mean, I really wish- It's really, should, it's I, really I a stripping out ads yeah, thing. I really don't yeah. understand. Just call it YouTube ad free. I feel like, why are we, <laughs> why are you burying the lead with a clunky <laughs> Premium <laughs> Light? Premium light. What does it get me? <laughs> well, no, no ads. And for for many folks, that might be like, that's the price is right. We're, we're I'm yeah. finally ready to to throw some money at uh, at you. YouTube is also very very aggressive about reminding me every single time I watch any <laughs> video. Do we want to uh, upgrade to YouTube Premium? No. <laughs> okay, but do you want to maybe upgrade to YouTube Premium? <laughs> it's I like. I mean, no, you're not gonna get me, but I, uh, I, I know that there are people who use YouTube in other ways than I do. I, I will say I watched a YouTube video in prep for today's show for one of the stories, and it was the first time in a while that I was kind of struck by like every three minutes there was some sort of ad break, and I think it was because it was you know a timely just breaking video or something like that. But it got me th like having the two stories kind of back to back in my mind. I was like. You know what? Seven seven euros doesn't sound uh, too crazy. I mean, I prefer dollars just for the exchange rate, but you know. <laughs> well, conventional wisdom says that since OLED screens don't use a backlight for black pixels, the screen just isn't really on. So using a phone's dark mode on an OLED screen is going to save you battery life. Yes. Well, a new study from Purdue University looked at if using dark mode actually does in fact save battery life. The researchers found that if a display is at 30 to 50 percent brightness, switching to dark mode uses 3 to 9 percent less power. At 100 percent brightness, dark mode used 39 to 40 percent less power. So obviously the brighter it is, the more you save. The researchers looked at Calculator, Google Calendar, Google Maps, Google News, Google Phone, and YouTube apps in the study across several OLED phones, including the Pixel 2, Pixel 4, Pixel 5, and Moto Z3. The researchers also found that the built-in Android battery consumption utility doesn't accurately measure power savings when in dark mode, so they created the Android Battery Plus app to do so. Yeah, it's it's so it's interesting to see the scale that this is able to you know to hit. Obviously, like that thirty to fifty percent brightness, I think they said was representative of having your phone kind of an auto brightness, and that's usually kind of where it averaged out to. Um, and so you know you're you're seeing you know that's some power savings, maybe gets you an extra hour or something if it, you're on that nine percent line. Uh, obviously, a hundred percent brightness, you know, kind of kind of scales directly to there. It is interesting though that there's a lot of these. We've seen this around kind of digital well-being stuff, where there's a lot of things that sound mm -hmm. like they make a lot of sense, and then when they do the science, you know, it's a little bit more of a of a mixed bag when it comes to, uh, you know, uh, just uh, what what's going to be more restful for your eye and what what's going to save you power and stuff like that, particularly with OLEDs. Uh, I, you know, it, it's important to point out this isn't like three to nine percent of your total battery. This is just the power that the screen is using. It's so using, it's it's yeah. not like it's because it's pushing less pixels because it doesn't have to render them because it's like not turning on the black pixels. Like it saves processing power or anything like that. It's just the screen. It seems like from this study. I've had my doubts about this for <laughs> some time now, and I think part of the reason is, and and yes, the idea of saving battery life and uh, you know saving your eyesight two different conversations i understand that but uh we have been in this whole sort of like blue light is bad that's where it's all coming from try to um try to avoid that as much as you can you know later in the day and especially if you're on a mobile device um well i mean any device really but a lot of people are on mobile devices a little bit later at night um uh, switch to dark mode wherever possible and i actually have done that with a variety of apps i feel like I strain more to the point where I'm actually upping my brightness half the time because I'm like, I just can't see the words. And, I, you know, I'm sure it's different for everybody, but I just don't know that this is the right, the right solution for us. 
uh, with our, you know, our tired eyes having been on the internet all day already. Yeah, well, and certainly things like screen sharpness, you know, where we're, you know, uh, you know, depending on the resolution of your screen and stuff like that, I can see, you know, having white text on a dark screen uh, that just kind of bleeds into gray a little bit easier for some reason. And I, I feel yeah. like for a lot of these wellness or, or whatever, these kind of conventional wisdom kind of things, a lot of it does come down to, well, if it, you know, if if it's causing eye strain for you, it doesn't matter scientifically, I guess, if a study showed that it, you know, your eye vibrates 6% less if you switch to dark mode, if it's an unpleasant experience for you, it's still an unpleasant experience to you, no matter if, you know, it, right. it, you know what, the, what that paper says. So I think there is a little bit of a, uh, uh, not even psychosomatic, but there is a, you know, it matters what your perception of the effect is as well, in this instance, at least. However, when it does come to battery life, uh, several percentage points do matter, <laughs> depending on where you are and what you're doing. So I totally get that. Um, it does not seem like, yeah, unless unless you're you're cranked up to to full <laughs> uh, brightness, it's going to make that much of a difference to you. If you're if you're on team full brightness all the time, this is going to be a game changer for you. <laughs> there you go. Um, if you, if you, if you love this show and we certainly hope that you do, but sometimes you just need the headlines or you'd like a headline version of the show while still listening to DTNS, which we also love, check out our related tech show, daily tech headlines, all the essential technology news in about five minutes at dailytechheadlines.com. Well, the future of Google's Pixel phone lineup has kind of been an open question uh, with the line sometimes going for more cutting edge tech. When you think about something like the 2019 Pixel 4, it had that project solely radar for motion tracking, kind of on that bid for a higher end or at least cutting edge. Uh, and then was followed by a, maybe a little bit more mid-range Pixel 5 and then pretty much an all-out budget offering uh, with the Pixel 4a. Uh, but Google has now given a preview of the Pixel 6 and 6 Pro and it definitely marks a return to flagship ambitions for the line. The main thing Google previewed wasn't the phone. This wasn't the actual phone announcement. Technically, uh, they admitted that the Pixel 6 and 6 Pro were coming out, but the, the big thing is a new system on a chip inside that they call Tensor, and it's named uh, after the Tensor processing unit they use in their data centers for AI processing. On the Tensor SoC is that same, uh, that same Google-made TPU for AI operations and a new Titan M2 chip. Otherwise, though, we don't know things like CPU, GPU, other components. We're not even knowing really who's making them at this point. Uh, there's been some hints out there, and you can kind of dig into the rumor sites uh, if you can't wait until the fall uh, when they're going to release the full Pixel 6 uh, release details coming out. Uh, Google is keen to frame the TPU inside the Tensor SoC, not just as another co-processor, which we've kind of seen. Uh, they had a uh, something for the, the camera pipeline as kind of a pro co processor along that. Made a lot of waves when it first came out. Uh, but they're pitching this as more of an essential part of the computing pipeline that will touch a lot of user-facing interactions. And that's really, you know, kind of on par with, with the CPU in terms of the kind of like the primacy of operations. Uh, demos using Tensor include a camera instantly merging a blurry shot of a movie of a moving child. You know, the child's face is really blurry, uh, but they had simultaneously taken another picture with an ultra wide at a faster shutter speed and were able to merge those basically like by the time you would go to view the photo uh, into a sharp image, as well as using HDR net processing on every single frame of a 4K video to make more realistic HDR. Uh, the hope is that the TPU can take enough of the workload off of the CPU and GPU to make the whole package feel faster, even though, you know, whatever it's using is going to be a, a, a commodity CPU, it seems like it would be a differentiator because it's able to take off that workload. In terms of the difference between the Pro and the regular Pixel 6, the Pro is a 120 hertz QHD screen and a 4X periscope telephoto camera. The regular Pixel 6 makes do with a mere 90 hertz screen and uh, an ultra wide and a standard camera as well. Design wise, it's interesting. The Pixel 6 and 6 Pro both use glass on both sides with a black horizontal bar for the rear cameras, kind of a, a pretty bold piece of styling. Uh, pricing is unknown, but Google hardware head Rick Osterloh says it will certainly be a premium price product. So there's speculation that this is going to be hitting around $1,000 plus. You think? <laughs> I mean, with all of that, imagine Google being like, and it's $750. Woo! Uh, this is the, the, the Google's new chip, the Tensor chip. Mm -hmm. It seems like a really big deal uh, here. And the you know, Google Pixel phones in the past, as you mentioned, Rich, 
uh, they kind of run the gamut. Um, they're, you know, are sort of more kind of feature phones and more high-end phones. This, the Pixel 6 seems like Google is going for Apple, you know, I mean, to, you know, or, or any, you know, it's Samsung or, you know, any company that's like, this is a premium product um, that they, they, you know, best of the best, but also it's a Google tip. And I wonder how that changes Google's relationship with OEMs going forward. Yeah, and it's it's kind of goes along with an existing trend that we've seen. Uh, certainly, Apple on this bandwagon, Nvidia uh, to some extent, um, Qualcomm getting in on this now, and and even Intel and their fab business is that like this this whole semi custom silicon thing, as opposed to we're just going to throw in a stock x86 or a stock ARM processor, call it a day, have like a set platform that differentiate just with software. Feels like we're at the tail end of that, uh, and 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 to your point about this being a big deal, I mean certainly for Google, again, you don't have a a pre-announcement feature like spotlight on a feature like this unless you feel like it's a really big deal. And there's been there's been some hay made that Rick Osterlo is is like kind of calling this the Google phone. We've we've people have wanted to put that tag on you know the Nexus phones way back in the day, and now going uh, uh you know into the Pixels, and they've kind of shied away from that, obviously to make OEM partners happy, I imagine. And Google kind of really leaning into that. You know, we, we've seen them trying to do like ultra high end premium Chromebooks before, like trying to like own that in terms of like that high, high, high end market. Um, it, I, you know, the phone space is weird. There's a lot of different economics besides just, hey, this phone looks cool and it has this top end feature uh, when you're when you're not named Apple. So I, I. I, I don't think we can say for sure, like, oh, this is going to be the surefire hit. This is going to be the thing that makes the Pixel phone the the number one selling phone or number one selling Android. Give make Samsung. I mean, sweat, the specs are pretty good though. The specs the, are pretty good, and yeah, I mean, the Pixel market share is so low at this point. Not because Google hasn't done a nice job, but I think you know Google has sort of you know been 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 walking a line of sorts <laughs> of you know what you know what what is it you know is it a maker of things or does it partner with makers of things? And I think that this is Google saying. We're making this. We're this is all us, and it's really good. And you're gonna like this phone. Last month, TikTok launched a pilot of a video resume feature. Yep, you heard that sentence right. Letting mm -hmm. users post videos to get jobs at partner companies such as Chipotle, Target, and Shopify. The pilot only went through July, so it was limited. But this seems to be a growing trend. Industry analysts saying that LinkedIn may soon add a similar feature. And companies like the WWE using TikTok to try and find its next ring announcer. So, you know, it's this whole kind of social aspect of, of, of getting people on board. Everybody seemingly hates the cover letter and resume routine. We've been doing it for years. Always sucks, right? But does a video resume seem like something we might all be making down the line? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, certainly the WWE thing, uh, certainly a fun thing they can do for their fans, but, you know, kind of a stunt. But I do think that there is like a legit reason why you would want a video resume other than writing a cover letter is perhaps the most soul-sucking experience you could possibly imagine. Uh, like, I, I feel like the the point, like part of the, part of the, like the quiet point of the resume or the CV and the cover letter is not just to demonstrate that you have qualifications that will... Uh, qualify you for qualifications that qualify you for a particular position. It's not like, oh, I spent so many years at company X, so many years at company Y. I have here's my, you know, list all your skills in Adobe Cloud or whatever. Part of it is also, hey, I can create a document that looks nice. I know how to, I like, I know how to competently use a word processor. I know how to, I, I have a certain level of quality of writing that I can employ uh, to be effective and to communicate. Uh, really well. I know a lot of that gets quantified down, and these are all scanned by bots that kind of pull out you right. know the key details that they're all looking for. Mm -hmm. But I feel like a video resume to me, depending on the company, can serve that exact same need, right? Kind of prove that you have these same skills, whether it's something you're in a customer service right. job and you want someone that can really turn it on uh, like you would for a TikTok video or something like that. They can think creatively. They right. have video editing skills. I think that is a uh, that has a lot of potential for job it, seekers in the future. I, I, I will say this. I mean, talking in the, I, I said this when we were doing the pre-show, like I've talked to, to HR people about how they go through resumes before. And one of the things they do is basically run a, a keyword search to make sure that 
one, you ha you hit all the points that the job description requires, and that's something you really can't do with video. But uh, uh, another interesting thing is the whole video aspect isn't new. I mean, uh, Sarah and I have both come from a broadcasting career where having a reel, having a compilation of your work uh, that's you know two to three minutes long that you submit on VHS or later on on DVD, <laughs> or in the past ten years you send a link to a YouTube with your reel, and I still have mine. Uh, that explains all the stuff you did. And I think in some ways this this might be kind of a cut down version of that. I will say there is a particular heinous and, and somewhat dark aspect to this in that employers might, and unfortunately I've seen this happen, where they they base a lot of their hiring decisions based on the appearance of the person. Oh, you don't look like you fit the culture of our you know company based on the appearance of the person. Perhaps they're not old enough or they're too old or they're, they're they they right. don't have the stylish yeah. clothes or they don't have the right makeup. You know, there's so many things I think that could go wrong with this that could definitely steer uh, you know, the the whole aspect of it. Although I do think it's a valuable tool, a valuable tool, I expect to see some some negative uh, opinions on this uh, you know, in in a short order. You know, it's it's you know, Roger, you mentioned HR departments. I have never worked in one. I certainly know people who have worked in HR departments. I have certainly submitted many resumes to HR departments, sometimes with great results, sometimes not. And you know, it's it's always it. This seems to me like the next gen of, you know, the uh, the resume that has a, a scent, you know, or has sparkles. Or you, you know, you have your headshot in a resume, even though people say it's corny. It's like, well, but it still gets you noticed, and people remember your face. Like there are all these sort certain ways that, it, if you really want a job, why not? You know, I mean, as long as you are staying true to yourself, and and th this is kind of a fun way to do that. I mean, I know we're only talking about a a, a few different companies, but but uh, it. It might be the way that resumes are, you know, in the future. It's like, what are you going to list all your qualifications on a piece of paper? No, we're not going to accept that. Where's your TikTok? You're going to link lip sync it to whatever the the hot hit is. Right now. <laughs> yeah. But but I do I do have a feeling like I have definitely applied for jobs like knowing like okay my resume is not going to be the strongest or something like that. But if I can get in that interview and I can you know you know show them you know some of the rich magic you know that'll that'll push <laughs> me over the top or something like that. I know that's not for everybody and I that's it's almost certainly hubris on my part. But I I feel like it one is not just as soul sucking as like putting dear who may, may concern please i would i have always dreamed of working for chipotle and would love to wrap burritos for them. you know th that's that's the worst if you can if you can make it fun and you know uh, at least you have something out of it that you can you can kind of say other than you know a resume uh you know it, I, I think it definitely has a lot of potential and you know signals that there the the things you need in a job the skills that you need uh, perhaps are are changing um for a lot of employers Indeed. Well, some of us are traveling in the summer, and if you are one of those people, if you need a fun, free place to visit, if you're spending time in my sort of neck of the woods, San Francisco, Chris Christensen has you covered. This is Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler with another Tech in Travel Minute. Going to do something a little different this week, and that is where to go if you like tech. You've seen the San Francisco cable cars, but I don't know how many of you know that they have no engine. They basically operate with a large pair of pliers that grabs onto a moving cable underneath the ground. If you want to see how that works, you can go to the free cable car barn and museum only take you about an hour or so to learn how cable cars work, and you're going to enjoy your cable car ride much better after you do that if you're a nerd who likes to know how things work. And there you can see the very large diesel engines that drive the cable in the street that move the cable cars. I'm Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler. Well, I gotta say, um, as a Bay Area person, the cable car is a beloved thing. And it's true, the cable car museum is really cool. I agree with you, Chris. Uh, I encourage anyone who comes out this way to uh, to give it a shot. All right, let's check out the mailbag, Rich. Oh, we got a good one from Monty. He sent an email in response to the DTNS special, chip shortage, the logistics issues, which you should check out if you haven't already. Uh, he wrote in and said, I live in Anaheim Hills and can see the shipping container ships lined up in the bay. 
As a design engineer and VP of software for our company, I've been hit with the shortage issue. Unlike an end of life issue, the shortage issue is a sudden attack on the production of existing products and causes an absence of stuff we can ship. We have 11 products that are currently suffering the shortage going from a couple of weeks to 52 and 100 plus weeks lead time. We don't ship tens of thousands of products, but only thousands per year, which we rely on folks like Aero, Digikey, and Mouser for parts. We are redesigning two of our higher quality or quantity products to meet demand. This has changed the way that we design for we are now looking at the immediate quantity of, of uh, existing or extant MPU parts that fit the design qualifications and purchasing them in quantity now. That is, we are redesigning products based on what we can actually or we get now. And I think that's that's one of the things like long term effects uh, that we are we're definitely seeing. We've seen a couple things with with counterfeit chips and, and people kind of repurposing chips because there are such shortage and not surprising to hear redesigning stuff, but uh, good to hear on the ground stuff, Monty. Thanks for sending that in. Absolutely, Monty. Thank you so much. Uh, if you have any feedback of anything that we talk about on the show, questions about anything that we have talked about on the show, ideas of what we should talk about on the show, all of those things should be sent to feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We love your emails. Please keep them coming. Shout out to patrons at our master and grandmaster levels. Today, they include Erwin Stir, Ken Hayes, and Philip Shane. Also, I don't know what happened in the water this weekend, but boy, do we have a bunch of brand new bosses. We've got Michael Babcock. We've got Dr. X1728. We've got Alex Oladele, Scotty Allen, Robert Bigelow, Craig Olson, and Steggy, I'm going to go ahead and call you Steggy01. They all just started backing us on Patreon. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, Doctor. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Scotty. Thanks, Robert. Thanks, Craig. And thanks, Steggy. Best Monday ever. And thanks to all of our patrons. Uh, you make the show possible. We could not do it without you. Uh, we know that you know this, uh, but we will continue to thank you every day because you are the best. We're also live on the show Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern. That's 2030 UTC. If you want to find out more, go to dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We'll be back tomorrow with Tom Merritt. Perhaps you've heard of him. Also, Seth Rosenblatt will be joining us. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>